and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. Shalom. Hello again. Well, back in our Covenants of God series this week, the Abrahamic Covenant. This is everybody's favorite. It's a wonderful covenant made so long ago, still in force today. It'll be in force in the kingdom to come. And uh, it was presented to uh, Gentile uh, idol worshiper, evidently, uh, the family of Terah in Ur of the Chaldees. Where is Ur? Well, it was near uh, Baghdad of today. <laughs> Abraham was technically an Iraqi. It would surprise Saddam Hussein, who was so anti-Semitic, who was so against the Israelis, that the original Israeli uh, was an Iraqi. Uh, I have a chart of all of the covenants here and uh, all of the historical periods. We started last week and talked about the Edenic and Abrahamic uh, Noahic covenant the last two weeks. The covenants made at the Garden of Eden and with Adam and with Noah, those with all mankind, so to say. Then God chooses Israel, and this is where we are tonight, at the Abrahamic covenant. Then the periods uh, of Israel's history, and we'll introduce the covenants as we go. Uh, and here, the coming of the Messiah, the period of grace and the millennium. The Abrahamic covenant has a sweep from back here, 2000 BC, right on through the cross and has application to the kingdom to come, as I had said. So let's look at it in the scriptures. Uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. It's important to, to say that he told him to get up and go. And uh, so he did to the promised land. And now the covenant. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. There's an awful lot in those two verses with plenty of import today. Uh, there are three major aspects, uh, a national aspect, a personal aspect, and an aspect to all the rest of the nations, the Gentiles. First off, the, the national aspect, obviously God is giving Abraham a country here. He clarifies uh, uh, the gift later on, Genesis 17, 8, for example. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, which we call Canaan uh, today, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Uh, this is the land covenant which is in contention today in, uh, uh, with the negotiations with the Palestinians, with land for peace or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the ownership of the land is Jewish. There's no biblical question about it. It was given to Abraham, repeated to Isaac, Jacob, on through the 12 tribes, and this is Jewish land. As to whether they want to negotiate with it, give parcels of it up, uh, that has happened through the ages, but the ownership of the land forever is Jewish. This covenant is said to be an everlasting covenant. I mean, that's God's word. And so, uh, and so it is. And as for Ishmael uh, and the Palestinians and so on, uh, the, who ultimately come from Ishmael, uh, verse 20 of the same chapter, and as for Ishmael, God says, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Now, surely the Arabs have at least twelve princes. They have twenty-one nations, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you count our nations, or God counts them as, as twelve princes, and they have been fruitful, and uh, they have multiplied. There are two hundred million Arabs. They're called the underdog but to the five million Israelis, but that's just the press. There are two hundred million Arab Muslim people in this world. 
and uh, that's quite a quite a star a, 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 a multiplication from the start with Ishmael. But the next verse is the key, Genesis seventeen twenty one. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. God chooses between Isaac and Ishmael, as He will choose between uh, Jacob and Esau, and so on. Well. Uh, the personal aspect of the covenant, we could look at Romans uh, 4, 3. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Paul uses it uh, as an example to show us what, what faith can do. Uh, Abraham had a pile of sins. Anybody that reads his life knows that. But he also had a terrific pile of faith and it was enough. Uh, to counterweight his sins and so on. That is how that covenant worked. And uh, God was a personal friend of Abraham and called him friend. Imagine being the friend of God. And thirdly, the Gentiles, the other nations. Uh, obviously, uh, the blessings and curses of the third verse, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Uh, you know, has been worked out through history. It's just true. Uh, the nations that, that bless the Jews, such as America, which allow, allows Jewish people their normal worship practices, their, their dietary laws, the costumes they may wear. Nobody complains about that or any other religion in this country. Uh, properly done in a democracy, the Jews will prosper and they will prosper the people they live with. Uh, this has worked well. Uh, Europe, which, which decimated the Jews through the ages, from the Spanish Inquisition to the Holocaust, Europe always killed out its cream and has always been a little bit weak. And uh, I think that's part of it. God has punished those that punished the Jews. And uh, that particular covenant is working out in this country today. I hope that we don't curse Israel in these peace negotiations because I think the covenant will still work on us. We'll be cursed. Now, in Genesis 15, it tells the story of how the covenant is ratified. Uh, animals are provided, a sacrifice is done, vultures come to try to eat the animals. Abraham gets up to shoo the vultures away to preserve the sacrifice. I'm paraphrasing the story. But God comes and puts Abraham in a deep sleep, as if to say, look, I don't need your help. I'll accomplish this without you, and that is the gospel. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Lord that does the work and uh, lives through us. We don't do it. But anyway, Abraham sleeps and dreams that someone else is in his place, walking with God uh, through these animals to ratify this covenant. That is a beautiful picture of, of what Christ does. He takes our place. Can I go to heaven with my sins? Can you go with your sins? Yes, we go in, with our sins because uh, uh, Jesus is standing in for us. We are in his ro white robes of righteousness, in effect. God looks at me and says, ah, my son, come in. Looks at you and says, my son, come in, because he is seeing that someone else in our place. It's a, it's a very beautiful picture of the gospel. Then, of course, the birth of Isaac, uh, they laughed when, <laughs> when God said Sarah would have a son. Sarah was uh, far too old by our reckoning to have a child. This is a miracle that God did. And uh, uh, Isaac becomes a, a type of the son of the patriarch. Uh, that is a, a symbol of Christ, the son of God. Uh, Isaac, who was offered in sacrifice on Mount Moriah, just as was Christ, who carried wood on his shoulders like Jesus bore his own cross on his shoulders. And Isaac, for whom God chose a Jewish bride, a Hebrew bride. This is a very important and, and elegant point. Uh, when it came time for Isaac to marry, Abraham didn't want him to marry a girl uh, of Canaan or Canaan. Uh, the, uh, he could find plenty of girls there, of course, but uh, back in Haran was a part of his family from the journey from Ur of the Chaldees. Some of them remained at Haran, which is up north in Syria, uh, maybe 500 miles, I don't know. But he sent his servant Eliezer all that way to look for a Hebrew girl. And uh, you know the story, uh, Genesis 24 tells it beautifully. He, he uh, 
came to a well and needed to water his animals. And there was a gracious young Hebrew girl there who helped him and, and uh, brought water and so forth. And uh, he, it says he looked upon her. She was comely, a virgin, uh, a beautiful young Hebrew girl. And he thought, well, I'll show her the gifts that Isaac sent. And so he got out the jewelry or whatever it was Isaac had, or Abraham and Isaac had sent along to try to woo the bride. And so um, she was wooed and won and agreed to go back and, and marry Isaac. And so the Jewish people begin. That's the mother of, of them all. And the father of them all is Isaac. Well, um, of course, Abraham was made Jewish when he made the covenant with God. And we're going to talk about his circumcision in this program. But Isaac really is the firstborn Jew and his wife, the first Jewish mother. So, uh, uh, the story is like the story of the church in a way. Isaac is like uh, Christ, so his bride, us, <laughs> the bride of Christ is like Rebecca. And Abraham the father sends Eliezer the servant, which is like the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit shows us you know, we haven't seen Jesus. We, we don't know who we're going to marry, but we see the gifts he has sent through the Holy Spirit. And we are wooed and won, and we're willing to go after uh, this Jewish prince, however far away, and marry him when we get there in a beautiful parallel of the gospel of Christ. Back after this. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. The soul of the Holy Land. Come with Zola on his next tour to Israel. These are the mountains of Judea, part of the land which God gave to Abraham. I met here with Rabbi Henri Noach and talked to him about the Hebrew meaning of Abraham's name we see there is a metamorphosis in his identity. Avram, meaning Av Aram, the father of Aram, of a particular uh, civilization, becoming the father of a multitude of nations. Av, in Hebrew, does not only mean father, it also means principle, a principle. Um, so Abram changes to Abraham. That's right. And Abram sort of meant uh, father of a specific nation. And Abraham means father of a multitude of, of nations. Of a multitude of nations. Likewise, in the same text on verse 15, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And our commentators explain the difference. Sarai... Uh, means my princess, the princess of a specific nation. Sarah, she is Sarat Ha'olam Kulo, uh -huh. the princess of the entire world. Yeah. So in both cases, what is a parochial identity? Avram, Sarai, becomes a universal identity. Let and me ask you, Rabbi, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it makes a question occur to me. Abraham and Sarah then become the father and mother of all the nations. But it didn't really happen that way. They're the mother and, mother and father of the Jews. Christian theologians would hold, ah, but they are also the mother and father of the Messiah who ultimately brings all the Gentile nations into the Israelitish covenants. That is correct. Um, and there is no contradiction. Do not forget that Ishmael, who was the child of Abraham through Hagar, his concubine, is traditionally, both in Jewish and Islamic sources, considered the founder of the Islamic, or, and in particular of the Arab nations. And Esav, or Esau, the brother of Jacob, is considered uh, the ancestor of a certain Magdiel in the Bible, who is, according to Jewish sources, the founder of Rome, and therefore of the, Greco, of the Roman Christian civilization. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yes. But you will note that the Jewish people today, just here in Israel, are a people in a very um, 
how would you say, in a very unusual way. It is a nation, a distinctive nation. That is why we define a Jew as one born of a Jewish parent, in this case of a mother, which defines the uh, national identity of many countries, of many nations. For example, I have a Dutch passport because my parents are, are Dutch. Um, however, uh, it is a nation of nations. There are, in Israel, the Jews come from 108 different nations. <laughs> you have Ethiopian Jews living side by side with Jews from the United States, from South Africa, from France, and so on and so forth. So really, this text where Abraham and Sarah are called the ancestors of a nation of many nations, relates at one at the same time to Gentile nations, but in particular to the Jewish nation, a nation of nations. For example, on Friday nights when we read uh, the text, uh, or when we recite a blessing sanctifying the wine and sanctifying, inaugurating the Shabbat, one of the texts that we, we relate, that we, that we recite is, Asher Bacharbanu Mikol Ha'amim, God who chose us from all the nations. In other words, the Jews come from all the nations. If you read your Bible, it tells you very clearly that God dispossessed all of those people and gave the land in perpetuity forever as an eternal inheritance to the Jewish people. Our friend Gary Cooperberg, who we've visited on several occasions while in Israel, is a Jewish settler living in Hebron. He believes with all of his heart that God's covenant with Abraham is forever. Now, further to the covenant with Abraham, you know, God promised Abraham that the Jews would control a, a land someday from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. That's a far bigger land than, than they can now control, and, and it would even take in Damascus in the north and part of the Sinai in the south. It, it would be much larger. If the uh, land is ultimately going to be larger, why are the present-day Israelis giving it away or making it smaller? Well, very simply speaking, our, our present-day leaders are not Bible believers in the real sense of the word. Yeah. They don't have faith in God. They don't believe in, in, uh, that the land of Israel was a divine process, that the return of the, land, of the Jews to the land is a divine process. They may say this, but that's just lip service. They don't really believe it. If they did believe it, we wouldn't have the strife we have today. If they conducted themselves as truly Jewish leaders, accepting the fact of our return to the land as fulfillment of biblical prophecy, as doing the will of God, then the world would perhaps recognize the legitimacy of, of the process of, of Zionism as being the real peace process, which will bring peace to all of mankind. We're not here to grab land because we, we say it's ours. It's not ours, it's God's. And God determined that there is a holy land and a holy people are to live in this holy land and conduct their lives according to his holy law and be an example to the nations of the world who will follow that example, not be coerced, but rather will follow because of all the good that will result of our behavior yeah. And then real peace would, would result. In the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the, you, you quoted correctly when you said God gave it the land in perpetuity because he said it's an everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. But Gary, you're living in the land, you're living in Abraham City. What do you see for the, the, the future, the near future? I, I mean, it, it doesn't look good. No, it, it doesn't look good, but Abraham is and has always been the prime example of faith in God. And this is the crux of the matter. If we really want to demonstrate faith in God, then there has to be a price to pay. There has to be a sacrifice. There has to be a way in which we can demonstrate sincere and true faith. If things are easy, if you can see that everything's wonderful, if, if you don't have to earn a living and, and, and everything is given to you, it's very difficult to demonstrate faith. But when things are seemingly impossible, and when the end looks like is coming any second and you're not going to be able to continue from one minute to the next and yet you keep going because you know that this is what God wants of you. That's genuine faith and that in effect is really a gift from God to give us the ability to express to Him that we really believe His promises and this is why we're living where we're living under the conditions in which we're living as an opportunity and a gift to show God that we really believe in His promises to us and I have no doubt that those promises will be fulfilled in our time. And one of the things that you learn here is how to minister out of weakness. You learn what Paul meant when he said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Chuck Cohen is the pastor of a Messianic congregation that meets weekly at the YMCA in Jerusalem. He reads from Genesis 17 regarding the sign of the covenant given to Abraham. 
Now God says, I'm going to give you all of this land. And then he makes an unconditional covenant. He puts Abraham to sleep and he goes through as a smoking furnace, mm -hmm. a firing pot. He's going through the pieces back in those days, meaning an unconditional covenant. Then we get to chapter 17 and God says, here's the sign of the covenant. And he says, you shall keep my covenant there for you and your seed after you. This is my covenant between me and you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. This is the sign of the covenant between me and you. What does circumcision involve? The shedding of blood. Mm -hmm. That's why it's the sign of a covenant, because a covenant was sealed with the shedding of blood. Now, let me ask you a question. When was the very first time in salvation history God's holy blood was shed to seal covenant? Most Christians would immediately say, well, on the cross. But when Yeshua was eight days old, his mother and father brought him to the temple and he was circumcised in fulfillment, it says, of the law of the Lord, of the law of God, of the law of Moses. And therefore, God's holy blood was shed to seal this covenant between God, Abraham, and the children of Israel. And that covenant definitely involved the land, as it says in Genesis 17. That's how serious God is about this covenant between himself and the land and giving it to the Jewish people. And that's why all of the world is so against the Jewish people coming back to possess their possessions. The world spirit does not want to deal with a living God who watches over his word to perform it. And yet God's doing it regardless of what the world says. make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. There's just so much about the Abrahamic covenant that has such meaning still today. I mean, what else in this world history is relevant that was started at 2000 BC, 4,000 years ago now, really? Uh, Dr. McCall of our ministry pointed out that one of the great debates in uh, the church today, how much law, how much grace, uh, now that Messianic congregations are springing up, they want to know how much Jewish law they should keep and how much grace there is, how much law they can let go of. He said, is a debate of the first century. It, it, it's in the scriptures, in the epistles. They were debating that about the Galatians and, and the uh, other new churches. How much law did they need to keep and how much grace could they count on? Um, but that's a 2,000 year old debate. The Abrahamic covenant is 4,000 years old. It's not only still in use, it's, it's still being argued over. It not only gave the Jews the land, it is virtually the uh, invention of the idea of redemption, the real promise of the Messiah. Uh, in other words, when, when God says, uh, uh, I'll make of thee a great nation, I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, that Abraham and his seed will be a blessing, uh, this is because of Christ. Uh, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, he says. Well, you could forgive Abraham for saying back, you know, but, but I'm a, a Jewish or I'm going to be a Jewish person. I'm here in Canaan. How can all the nations be blessed by me? Through his seed, uh, the Messiah, all nations of the earth are blessed. Uh, Jesus is known around the world certainly the only Jewish person known around the world, uh, maybe Einstein or somebody of that stature, but Jesus is better known. And uh, the Gentiles indeed have been blessed through this Abrahamic covenant, through this 4,000-year-old agreement between God and his friend. 
And then Isaac, uh, the type of Christ, the son of Abraham, like the son of God, you know, we could continue and talk about that sacrifice. God asked Abraham to pass a test. Uh, that is, he said, get thee up and go, take thy son, thine only son. And Abraham the faithful answered, Hineni, here I am. <laughs> and he got up early in the morning, it says, and he took Isaac and he took some wood and they started to walk to Mount Moriah. And God said, don't sacrifice in every place that thou seest, but only on the mountain I'll tell thee of, Genesis 22, 2. And they started to walk. That's not a short distance. That's, that's well, three days travel uh, to get from uh, on foot from uh, Beersheba to Jerusalem and hot desert type of travel. And they uh, uh, approached Jerusalem from the south and are coming to Mount Moriah. Isaac carrying the, the wood on his uh, back uh, like Christ carried his cross. And he is offered in sacrifice, but he isn't sacrificed. Why? Because the thicket, the, a ram was caught in a thicket. Now, <laughs> it's strange, isn't it, for a ram, which is a mountain climbing animal, to get caught in a thicket, but there were thorns, and the thicket got hold of the ram, and he could not get loose. Jesus wore those same thorns for us, so they made him a crown of thorns, and, and he wore our sin in that manner. Well, this, this was another salvation by thorns, you might say, where the, uh, the ram was taken to sacrifice instead of Isaac. And then how he was caught, by his horn. The ram's horn is the trumpet of the Bible. That's what they blew at the walls of Jericho to, to knock them down. That's evidently what we're going to hear at the rapture of the church when it says the sound of the trump of God is that call of the ram's horn. And uh, the ram's horn, the rabbis teach, is a symbol of deliverance. It is the trumpet that delivers a people. Uh, Isaac is the first Jew. In effect, when that ram is caught by his horn, the Jewish people are delivered and uh, uh, by the trumpet, and then they're delivered into the promised land when Joshua blows his horn, and finally when the church goes to heaven, it's promised land, Jews and Gentiles believing in the Jewish Messiah, then the trumpet will sound again, the ram's horn will again deliver a people. It's a very beautiful symbol. Well, our offer this week, the series Israel by Divine Right. Since we're talking about the Abrahamic covenant and the ownership of the land, I want you to, to see our commentary on it. I made this series in answer to teachings I was hearing from different places, including Dallas Seminary at the time, uh, that the, the Israel did not have a right to the land, or the Palestinians had an equal right, or whatever. That just isn't so if you're reading the Bible. And we made the whole series Israel by divine right to say who God gave the land to. You can have the videotapes for $99. It's a very uh, long, uh, wonderful series, I promise you. The book is $10. The music cassette, and many people have, have liked that Israel by Divine Right music, is $12. So write into the post office box or call with your credit card at our toll-free number. And Sha'alu Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.